Greetings, friends. And um, here we are again. Uh, here we are, too, also suddenly um, near the uh, end of the journey, right? Our next to last, uh, next to last chapter. You know, and in teaching a variety of um, social studies courses, one of the things that um, I'm going to miss uh, about this, and uh, fortunately, I'll probably have the, uh, the opportunity to do it again. One of the things I'm going to, to miss I, 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 is what I enjoy uh, about, um, about this, uh, the subject matter here in the uh, Western Civilization courses is that um, you kind of get to see how things um, uh, don't happen in, in vacuums. And uh, I'm trusting that, um, you know, that has been, um, uh, the lights have kind of gone off in um, you know, some of your minds in that regard. It's kind of a cool, you know, cool thing to, uh, uh, to see, right? And, um, We've been gradually, one of the things we, it's been a kind of a, a common denominator throughout our study here is you kind of gradually see the world slowly coming together, right? In this chapter here, we see it, I think, arguably tighten, right? Um, and of course, not the way uh, to where it has been in the 20th, 21st century, but we gradually see it tighten, uh, not only more, but perhaps even faster uh, than maybe even the years put together, what we, which we've looked at. And we're going to be looking at roughly about AD 1000 to 1300. So I'm going to turn to page 473 and um, we'll um, proceed, funnel our way down through the, through the lesson. So um, I'm going to get up the terms here. I, I have um, some kind of major heads up terms we're going to be taking a look at. We're going to look at the objectives and, and uh, so forth. Some of the major heads up terms here are going to be uh, Entropo, Entropo, um, multi ethnic trading stations, often supported and project, protected by regional leaders where traders exchange commodities and replenish supplies in order to facilitate uh, long distance trade. Jizya, Jizya, this is a special tax that uh, uh, non-Muslims were forced to pay to their Islamic rulers in return for which they were given security and property and granted cultural autonomy. Sufism, emotional and mystical form of uh, Islam that uh, uh, appealed to the uh, the common folks. Delhi Sultanate, a Turkish Muslim region in northern India, that through its tolerance of cultural diversity, brought political integration without enforcing cultural homogeneity. Flying cash, letter of exchange, our early predecessors of paper money. Kind of cool, right? Uh, first developed by guilds in the northern uh, Song province of uh, Shaanxi that uh, actually eclipses coins by the uh, 13th century. Manorialism, a system in which the manor, a lord's home, its associated industry and surrounding fields served as the basic unit of economic power and this was an alternative to the concept of feudalism, right? The hierarchical relationship of kings and lords, vassals, and, and uh, the peasantry for thinking about the nature of power in Western Europe from around this time period, we're gonna be taking a look at 1000 AD to 1300 AD. The Mali Empire. Western African empire founded by the legendary King Sudiata in the early 13th century. Sudiata um, facilitated thriving commerce along the routes, linking the Atlantic Ocean, the Sahara and beyond. Thinking ahead here, I don't know if I 
uh, really dwell on him uh, uh, too much, but um, he's the driving force behind the Mali Empire. The Chamu Empire, South America's first empire centered on the Shan Chan and the Mooch Valley on the Pacific coast from 1000 through 1470 AD. Uh, their development was fueled by agriculture and commercial exchange. The Toltecs, uh, modern day Mexico, the Mesoamerican peoples who filled the vacuum left by Teotihuacan's decline, former you know, the uh, old name capital, which is uh, now modern day Mexico City, established a temple filled capital and commercial hub at Tula. The Cahokia people, commercial um, city on the Mississippi River. We start to see here um, development in North America, right? I've said a couple, three times this semester that uh, the North American continent or the Johnny come lately is on the scene. Uh, the Cahokia commercial city on the Mississippi River for regional and long distance trade of commodities such as salt, shells and skins of manufactured goods such as pottery, textiles and jewelry marked by massive artificial hills akin to earthen pyramids used to honor spiritual forces. A little backdrop here before we get into the um, get into the actual meat and potatoes of um, the lesson this week. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at at uh, advances in this one a big picture things here advances in uh, maritime technology, and this leads to increased sea trade, transforming these coastal cities uh, into global trading hubs and elevating Afro-Eurasian trade to these unprecedented levels. Uh, intensified trade and religious integration shape four major cultural spheres, um, the Islamic world, India, China, and Europe. Sub-Saharan Africa is drawn into Eurasian exchange resulting into a true Afro-Eurasian wide network, while the Americas experience more limited political, economic, and cultural integration. The Mongol Empire integrates many of the world's major cultural spheres. So the core objectives here for this particular chapter, we wanna identify technological advances of this period, especially in um, you know, ship design and navigation, and explain how they facilitated the expansion of Afro-Eurasian trade. We want to describe the varied social and political forces that shaped the Islamic world, India, China, and Europe. And we want to compare both the internal and integration uh, and external interactions of Sub-Saharan Africa with those of the Americas. And where and why do conflicts and new empires emerge? So becoming the world, we have the crisscrossing of people, money, goods, and ideas to, um, again, these three related themes, trade along sea-based routes increased. You have coastal cities that expanded, greater trade and integration generated the world's four major cultural spheres, China, India, the Islamic world, and Europe. And the Mongol Empire ruled over large territories in many of the world's major cultural spheres. Let's take a look at this here, the development of, uh, of maritime trade. And in the, in the 10th century AD, the sea routes were becoming more important than land networks. So especially for long distance trade. So you have improved navigational aids, better map making, uh, refinements in shipbuilding, and uh, the new political support for shipping made seaborne trade easier and uh, slashes its costs. So 
these developments also fostered the growth of maritime commercial hubs, uh, otherwise called anchorages. Right where the name Anchorage, Alaska comes from, right? Which further facilitated the expansion of maritime trade. And you can see the new types of ships and the development of commercial hubs. Major um, entrepôts we're going to talk about here. Um, I would say too that although it, it may seem ironic to um, assert after invoking a shipwreck as evidence, the business of shipping uh, uh, on the whole um, became less dangerous in the period from 1000 to 1300 AD. Thanks not only to those innovations in shipbuilding, but also to uh, local political support. So you had these maritime traders who were enjoying the protection of political authorities, such as the Song rulers in China, uh, who maintained a standing navy uh, that protected ta uh, traders and lighthouses that guided the trading fleets in and out of the harbors. Your um, long distance trade spawned the growth of commercial cities and these cosmopolitan uh, entrepôts served as transshipment centers located on land between borders or in ports where ships could drop anchor. So beginning in the late 10th century AD, several regional centers became major anchorages in the maritime trade uh, in the West, um, the Egyptian port city of Alexandria on the Mediterranean, and probably Cairo too, just up the Nile. And then you had near the tip of the Indian subcontinent, the port of um, Quilon, which is now Colum. And then in the Malaysian archipelago, the city of Malacca, where in the east you had the Chinese city of Huangzhou. And you can take a look at uh, map 10-1, right? And you can um, find all of these um, trading centers. The Islamic world in a time of political fragmentation From the outset, Muslim rulers and clerics dealt with large non-Muslim populations. And even as these groups were converting to Islam, uh, the rulers accorded non-Muslims religious toleration uh, as long as the non-Muslims accepted Islam's political domination. They did, however, have to pay a special tax, a jizya, and defer to their Muslim rulers um, as, a, uh, as a result. You have environmental challenges during this time period, severe climate conditions, freezing temperatures and lack of rainfall um, afflicted the Eastern Mediterranean and the Islamic lands of Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau and the steppes region, the steppe region of Central Asia in the late 11th and 12th centuries. And you can see there that I mean, climate change, extreme climate change has been with us uh, long before uh, the industrial age. Turn to map 10-2 and take a look at the Islamic world, about 900 AD to 1200. When um, they flooded into the Iranian plateau in 1029, they, uh, the um, Saluk Turks, the Saluk Turks flooded, their, flooded into the area in 1029. They contributed uh, to the end really of the um, magnificent cultural flourishing of the early 11th century. And when the Seljuk warriors ultimately took Baghdad in 1055, and Baghdad, you see that on your Map 10 to, of course, we're looking at modern day Iraq, right? Uh, in 1055, they established a nomadic state 
in Mesopotamia in place of the once powerful Abbasid state that by this point lacked the resources to defend its lands and its peoples. Besides that, they were weakened by famines and, and pestilence. So the um, Seljuk invaders destroyed institutions of learning and uh, public libraries and, and basically looted the uh, region's uh, antiquities. Again, it's map 10 too. We'll take a look now at um, the spread of Sufism. And uh, even in the face of all this political splintering, which I just spoke of, uh, Islam spread was facilitated by a popular, highly mystical and communal form of the religion called, called Sufism. The term Sufi comes from the Arabic word for wool, which uh, many of the early mystics wrapped themselves in to mark their, um, their penitence their um, you know, repentant attitudes toward, toward God, right? Uh, for sins they had committed. And they performed ecstatic rituals such as repeating over and over again the name of God. In time, groups of devotees gathered to read aloud the Quran and uh, other religious texts. What was Islam? Islam evolved from Muhammad's original goal of uh, creating a religion for Arab peoples, cultural blossoming in all fields of high learning. And it becomes one of the four cultural spheres uh, during uh, this particular period. India as a cultural mosaic, And you can turn to map 10.3, take a look at that. And you have these um, shifting political structures. When um, Turkish warlords actually began entering India, uh, the uh, Rajas had neither the will nor the resources to uh, resist them after centuries of, of um, fighting off invaders. Uh, the Turks did introduce their own customs while accepting local social structures, such as the hierarchical Varna system. The Turks constructed grand mosques and built impressive libraries uh, where scholars could toil and, and basically share their wisdom with the court. The um, most powerful and enduring of the Turkish Muslim regimes of Northern India was the Delhi Sultanate lasted for about 20 years, 12 or 300 uh, years, 1206 to 1526. And their rulers brought this integration politically, but also uh, they strengthened the cultural diversity, if you will, and tolerance that were probably already a hallmark of Indian social order. But Islam never really fully dominated South Asia because the sultans did not uh, forced their subjects uh, to convert. What was India? Well, during the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, India became the most diverse and, and in some respects, the most tolerant region in Afro-Eurasia. Uh, India in this era arose as an impressive but fragile mosaic of cultures, uh, religions, and uh, ethnicities. Over on page 486, uh, interesting Hindu temple. Although Buddhism uh, had been in decline in India for centuries, it too became part of the cultural intermixing in this period um, as the, you know, the Vedic uh, Brahmanism evolved into Hinduism, which we talked about back in chapter eight. It also absorbed many Buddhist doctrines and practices such as nonviolence and vegetarianism. Uh, the two religions became so similar in India that Hindus simply uh, considered the Buddha to be 
uh, one of their uh, one of their deities. Go to page or map ten four and um, ten five. And take a look at here what was China. Your exchanges with outsiders help China develop develop a particular identity, right? As the uh, the Han identity. So in effect, the um, Song Chinese oversaw the world's um, first manufacturing revolution, producing finished goods on a large scale. Uh, for consumption far and wide. Uh, at the same time, merchant guilds in Northwestern Shanxi developed the first letters of exchange or paper money, which they called flying cash. Uh, these letters linked Northern traders with their colleagues in the South and before long printed money became more common than uh, the minted coins for, um, for trading purposes. And in Japan, China's neighbors, nomads, Japan and Southeast Asia and Japan, for instance, leaders distanced themselves from Chinese influences, but they also developed a strong sense of their islands, uh, distinctive identity. You can see just immaculate uh, temple of the region at the bottom of page uh, 491. You can check that caption out on your own. Turn to me page, um, or, uh, map 10.6, map 10.6, and you see some, um, you can see the Khmer Empire, and which uh, I believe that um, immaculate uh, temple is, um, emerges from. What was China? Exchanges with, outside, it's, uh, with outsiders, private culture, uh, crystallizing Chinese identity, and probably the wealthiest of the four major uh, cultural spheres. Christian Europe. Christian Europe. We uh, had mentioned earlier about the feudal system. And here, the, the peasantry's subjugation to the knightly class was at the heart of a system scholars have called feudalism, uh, emphasizing the power of the local lords over the peasantry. But a more accurate term for this system is manorialism, which emphasizes instead the manor's role as the basic unit of economic power. So the manor comprised the Lord's fortified home or castle and the surrounding fields were controlled by the Lord, but worked by uh, the peasants as free tenants or as um, serfs tied to the land and the village in which those peasants lived. Turn to map 10.7 on page 495. Russian lands modeled themselves after the Byzantine Empire, not Rome or Western Europe. And uh, one of the um, earliest pieces of tapestry and hence pieces of art in, uh, in Western Europe would be the Bayeux tapestry. And you can see that um, on page 496. An embroidered quilt like uh, material. Well, what was Christian Europe? What was Christian Europe? Intellectuals were beginning to um, gather in Paris to form one of the first European universities, a sort of trade guild, if you will, of scholars. And these professional thinkers endeavored to prove that 
Christianity was the only religion that fully addressed the concerns of all rational beings. Such, such was the message of Thomas Aquinas, who wrote Summa Contra Gentiles, the summary of Christian belief against non-Christians in 1264. And the growing number of churches, new religious orders, and universities began to change what it meant to live uh, in a Christian Europe. Christianity's relations with the Islamic world. You had the uh, Crusades, late 11th century, wave of attacks against the, uh, the Muslim world. The assaults um, didn't really accomplish much outside of hardening people against um, Christianity. Uh, the the long-term effect though, I think, in my opinion, it, you know, one of the sad chapters of this was it hardened Muslim feelings against the uh, Franks and uh, millions of non-Western Christians who had previously lived in harmony uh, in Egypt and Syria with Muslims. And basically, basically the Crusades really had nothing to do with uh, religion. I mean, you had a lot of idle youth in Europe, they were getting into trouble. And uh, the Pope at the time thought this would be a good distraction for them uh, and, and get them out of uh, uh, certain towns that they were causing trouble with. Uh, you had a lot of adventure seeking individuals uh, looking for profit and gain. So, and, and a lot of those folks wound up getting, after the first crusades, just wound up getting swallowed up with the Muslim traders. So probably in a Christian sense, right? In a biblical Christian sense of people being led by Jesus, uh, probably very little of that, right? Southern Europe and the uh, Islamic world, other crusade-like campaigns of Christian expansion were, were more successful. Worlds coming together, Sub-Saharan, Africa, and the Americas. And you turn to map 10.8, highlight some of these areas here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the Mali Empire, right? The Mali Empire. And in the early 13th century, right? in the early 13th century, get down to my, stay here. In the early 13th century, the Mali Empire became the Nemandi successor to the Kingdom of Ghana. And we talked a little bit about that in chapter nine. The origins of the Mali Empire and its legendary founder are enshrined in the epic of Sundiata, right? Talked about him earlier, his triumph, which occurred in the first half of the 13th century kind of marks the victory of new cavalry forces over traditional foot soldiers. Uh, then you have Mansa Musa, perhaps Mali's most famous sovereign. He made a celebrated Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca around 1324, 1325. The um, Mali empire boasted of two of West Africa's largest city. Uh, the Jinn and the Antropu dating back, um, the Jinn was an Antropu dating back to about 200 BC, and it was a vital assembly point for caravans laden with salt, gold, and enslaved people preparing for journeys west of the Atlantic coast and north over the Sahara. More spectacular was the city of Timbuktu founded around 1100 as a seasonal camp for nomads. And um, it grew in um, size and um, importance under the patronage of various uh, Mali kings. Uh, enslaved people might work as soldiers, seafarers, domestic servants, or plantation workers. Um, once trade began between East Africa and uh, the Indian Ocean. A 
coming to the Western Hemisphere. Here too, um, commercial and expansionist impulses foster closer contact among the peoples who live there. Uh, the Andean states of South America, growth and prosperity in the Andean region gave rise to South America's first empire, right? The Kimu Empire developed early in the second millennium uh, in the fertile uh, Mucha Valley bordering the Pacific Ocean. And you can turn to map 10.9 and um, see this. Let me see. And then the Toltecs, the Toltecs of uh, Mesoamerica, and you can see map 1010. Uh, the Toltecs filled the political vacuum left by the decline of the Teotihuacan and tapped into the commercial network radiating from the rich valley of central Mexico. Again, we're talking about um, the, what is now the you know, region of Mexico City. And then we turn our attention to the uh, North America. North American, um, trying to think about, I'm saying it in a plural way here, a singular way, first North American empire, the Cahokians, as in uh, South America and Meso as Mesoamerica, cities took shape at the hubs of trading networks across North America. Uh, the largest was Cahokia, and this is along the Mississippi River near modern day East, uh, East St. Louis, uh, Illinois, not Missouri, just across the river from, um, from St. Louis. Uh, ultimately, Cahokia's success bred its downfall as uh, woodlands fell to the axe and soil lost its nutrients, timber and food became scarce. So in contrast to the um, sturdiness of some of the groups in the Arabian area, uh, the Cahokia's river canoes could not, they could only carry limited cargoes. Uh, Cahokia's commercial networks met their limits. So ultimately then when the creeks that fed its water system could not keep up with demand, engineers changed their course, but um, uh, to no avail. And um, yeah, I'm gonna go to the Mongols. Lastly, take a look at the Mongols here. Map 10, 11 on page. 5, 10, and 5, 11. And I think we'll finish up with them, yes. Uh, wielding heavy compound bows made of sinew, wood, and horn, uh, the Mongol archers were deadly accurate over 200 yards, uh, even at full gallop. They're small but steady and sturdy horses, capable of withstanding extreme cold, bore saddles with high supports in front and back, enabling the warriors to maneuver at high speed. So with their feet secure in iron stirrups, the archers could rise in their saddles to aim their arrows without stopping. So these expert horsemen often remain in the saddle all day and all night. And uh, even sleeping with their horses continued, continued on. Uh, each warrior kept many horses, replacing tired mounts with fresh ones so that the armies could cover up to 70 miles uh, per day. Quite, quite impressive. So Mongol need for grazing lands contributed to their desire for conquest and they depended on settled people for grain and goods. They began expansion in about 1206 under a united cluster of tribes. Mongols also invaded Korea, 1231. OK. 
Okay. So conclusions. Trade and migration across long distances made Afro-Eurasian prosper and certainly more integrated. Trade and migration in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Americas, probably a lesser degree of integration than uh, Afro-Eurasia. Okay. Graphic organizer. Uh, we'll recap that. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, here we today we talked about the development of maritime trade, the importance of sea routes, navigation aids and maritime hubs, shipbuilding, uh, the cosmopolitan entrepôts, uh, the Islamic world in a time of political fragmentation. You have tolerance uh, toward outside religions as long as they accepted um, Islam's dominance. Turkish groups from Central Asia moved by climate conditions invaded and weakened the Abbasid state. Uh, India as a cultural mosaic, a uh, mosaic of different cultures, religions, and ethnicities. Uh, you have elements of Buddhism that gets mixed in with Hinduism. Uh, Song China, uh, first manufacturing revolution is found there. Uh, they developed paper money and uh, the Japanese um, separate uh, from them to develop their own identity over on the, you know, the Japanese island. Christian Europe, Christian identity via churches and universities. Uh, the Crusades served the hardened Muslims to our non-Western Christians. And Russia modeled its Christianity after the Eastern end of the Roman Empire. Remember back in the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople. Uh, your Orthodox churches, you see your Russian Orthodox churches today. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Americas, uh, commercial expansion and uh, impulses. You bring the Chimu, the Toltec and Cahokia people to have something in common. Uh, the Cahokia's demise depleted over resources. Uh, you start to see some slave trade under uh, Islam. People worked as soldiers, seafarers. Uh, domestic servants or plantation workers. And uh, the Mali Empire, right, becomes a center for caravans. And then we ended up with the Mongol transformation, right? Uh, kind of impressive, right? The horseback riding technology uh, contributes to their strength, um, you know, stirrups and, and saddles. And then your nomad warriors who could ride up to 70 miles per day. And there you have it. So let's look at what's up ahead. And we're heading up to some very important things. And you have the standard fair stuff this week um, uh, as you read and uh, you have um, not these ones here, but you have several videos and three videos that I have lined up for you. Again, short ones. No one is, not too many people are accessing or, or citing those in their discussions. That would certainly pre please the prof, as they say, right, if that happened. Review quiz. This week, I'm going to have it on Wednesday and Thursday, right? By Friday, you'll be able to see your correct answers. So if you're interested in doing the review quiz, take it on those two days. The review quiz, something that probably needs to be said because, um, well, the paper is coming up on the 5th, just around the corner, right? We're going to be flipping the calendars, right? Into December. The final is coming up right on the 14th. Um, the study guide for the final, just go back through your review quizzes, study your review quizzes, and uh, that'll give you a pretty good idea what's going to be on the final. Um, again, if you have a 93.7 at the least, uh, you will be exempt from this final. I'll let you know who that is. And then Monday, I jumped the gun there, Monday, chapter 11, our last chapter, right? The crisis and recovery in Afro-Eurasia. So, okay. 
Right. As I always say, questions, comments, uh, don't be afraid to get a hold of me. Uh, my office hours uh, generally for your group is in the evenings. Uh, I do look at things during, during the course of the day, but I have uh, live classes elsewhere. So I'm uh, uh, kind of tied up with that. But um, in the evenings, I will I get a hold of you guys. You know, um, if you shoot me an email Tuesday morning, 95% chance I will have answered that by the end of Tuesday evening. Uh, if you desire a uh, phone call or Zoom, that's perfectly fine too during that, during that time period. So you guys have a great week and uh, I will uh, talk to you next time, all right? Bye-bye.